I'm here today with my friend Alejandro Pisanti, who's a member of the Internet Hall of Fame. He's a longtime leader of the Internet Society and a professor of Internet and Information Science at the National Autonomous University of Mexico and just a longtime contributor to the research that's been done by the Imagining the Internet Center about the future of the Internet. Thank you so much for being here. It's a great honor, uh, Liam. Uh, I have to state this on the record. I am in awe of the work you, Jana, and the teams around you have been doing over many years in different institutions. It's a fantastic, awesome work. Thank you so much. Well, for starters, I, I've given your your title and, and your the things that you teach, but let's expand on your credentials. Uh, can you tell us what you're working on now and in the coming months? What's getting the majority of your attention and your focus these days? days. Uh, thank you, Lee. Um, as, uh, as you know, I am a professor at the School of Chemistry at the National University of Mexico. My PhD, which I uh, did uh, also at the National University of Mexico, is in theoretical chemistry. It was mostly computational applications of quantum physics to the electronic structure and chemical bonding and so forth, especially in my field, in, in my case of solids. But our groups have expanded into lots of molecular uh, biochemical, pharmaceutical, and so forth research. I don't follow it directly hands-on, but I follow it closely because these are my colleagues and my former students as well. So I moved into computing in parallel to chemistry. And in the early 1990s, in 1991 in particular, I realized I, I was given a charge of uh, IT policy at the university. Uh, National University of Mexico is a big animal. We have... Uh, close to 400,000 students between our high school system and our grad, uh, graduate and postgraduate schools. We have about 60,000 academic staff. Uh, we have outreach in every state of Mexico. We have several schools and research centers. We have the, we run the National Seismological Service. We run uh, uh, an observatory in a high mountain in the Baja, which is uh, very successful. We have two ocean-going oceanographic ships. Uh, you know, it, it's it's a big outfit. We have functions that sometimes in other countries are given to to government entities. To, for example, we hold a national library uh, for for the country. Uh, so it's a very multidisciplinary university, and we get to do lots of stuff. At that time was the introduction of the internet. I had my first contact with what became the internet in 1977 or 79 in the University of Indiana, in, in Indiana University in Bloomington, uh, using computers from Livermore and Berkeley and uh, from somewhere in the Atlantic side uh, over the ARPANET, which was, uh, you know, in, in, in development at the time. Uh, I made my first forecast or prediction about information technology and society there because we were given... Uh, small uh, handheld terminals which used a telephone coupler for transmitting information by sound and used thermal paper they called the Texas Instrument 700s and the student there said that they were getting them in their college in the US for the dorms and said gee this can wreck your family life even if you're single living in a dorm it will still wreck your family life the ability having having a computer in your in your bedroom nice. and man was that right uh I, I mean i love it but it wrecks family life uh so i moved to the internet society as a as a as a, as a social service thing and it's a it's it's a civic service part um i had when when we started having even before having the web when we started having things that were called Archie and Veronica, which were systems for access of remote to remote information, remote files, mainly in universities or the Gopher protocol, uh, I realized that we were getting a lot of benefit from other universities and asked, well, what can, what can we contribute? I call it presumptuously uh, my Kennedy moment. That's not what the internet can do for you, but what you can do to the for the internet. It's like, you know, uh, be, be a decent uh, citizen and contribute at least uh, what's within your power. And that was a, a great philosophy for our university. We created the Internet 2 Consortium of Mexico. On, 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 on that basis, we affiliated this to, to UK, to the Internet 2 effort in the US, became peers. That's sort of the, 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 the start of my Internet history. And uh, I later, in 1998, became a member of the first board of ICANN, which is the 
Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. It runs the policy development for the one centralized part of the whole internet, which is the system of uh, uniquely valued identifiers like domain names and IP addresses. And that was a great learning experience as well. Uh, Every one of us comes from a place like Mexico saying, well, I'm going to show you what the third world has or the development countries have to contribute. And lots of people have already done it. So it's like very sobering to be sitting in a room with people who created the internet, like Vinton Surf and Steve Crocker, or people who were pushing technology to the edge uh, in, in, in the business realm, like Esther Dyson and so forth. Uh, we created a system that's very responsive to user, final user needs, uh, responsive to market as well as state intervention. It's a it's an ongoing experiment, but it has been very successful. And it, of course, it uh, was uh, the first you know practical experience in internet governance outside the Internet Engineering Task Force. Uh, what I've learned over the years, and I try to apply as, you know, with these different experiences, I ran the computer operation, the internet operation, and the telecoms operation for our university for many years. I was head of the distance education uh, unit, which was very, very young and new, although it built over on, on a long experience of open education in the university. So what I approach and, and what I think will, will lead us to, to the next question is, what's actually new? Uh, the internet is extremely disruptive. We know the, the, the internet changes everything. And thus now we can again say internet, artificial intelligence is going to change everything. But exactly what is it that it changes? How does it change it? What's, you know, uh, the input to the change, the process of the change, and the output of the change? Instead of, you know, being bedazzled by these uh, constant new novelties, and then, of course, being scared uh, by, you know, the, the, the effects of the thing. I've coined uh, personally the, the, a word which is the algolem rhythm. And I speak of the algolem rhythm when people are scared uh, by things that the algorithms of social media, of search, of YouTube, and so forth are doing, and give them golemic properties. This is this monster. And you know, this has very ancient roots. Humans have been scared of their own creations for almost as long as there's been a civilization able to record this reaction. The myth of Prometheus, we must remember that Frankenstein, uh, the, the, the novel that's actually subtitled, uh, it's titled Frankenstein or the New Prometheus. I mean, this is really a, a, a thing that has roots very, very uh, deep in human consciousness. So we have to realize, for example, that you know when you see phishing as a crime, it's not new, it's fraud. It's a simple fraud, maybe aided by a supplantation of impersonation, by a, which is illegal as well, it's equally criminal. Uh, and of course, then you begin to see what happens. You know, instead of being able to scam seventy people by talking to them on the sidewalk or in, a, you know, in 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 a, in a shopping mall, now you're able to address seventy million people uh, uh, with one click. And then, of course, you can fool a few of them and and get their money. Uh, what? You are doing is exactly I mean, what the fisher is doing is exactly the same thing as 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 the uh, the guy who approaches you with a with a suit and tie and uh, uh, and a clipboard. It happens physically. It happened physically even as as, uh, as recently as four years ago to a friend's mother. Uh, but you know this guy can be tracked, uh, so his identity is exposed. He works in the national realm instead of crossing borders like fishers do. So when what happens with this? When legislators try to legislate, they try to begin to, with, you know, with the flashy side of cybercrime being all these complicated things. And instead of modifying the criminal, the penal code, and say, you know, we have one more clause to the, to the types of fraud that exist. You have postal fraud, you have telegraphic fraud. Now you can have internet fraud. And then, of course, you have to think of the code, of the procedural code, how you're going to prove this thing, who has the burden of the proof, and what's going to be you know, the procedurals of, you know, chain of custody, you know, quality of the evidence, weight of the evidence, and so forth. And also how you're going to convince the police guys in country really far away from you uh, that it's actually important to go and catch those criminals who are not affecting their own nationals. So this kind of thought has brought me, as you know, to a six-factor mapping uh, procedure uh, for online to offline which basically takes hyperscale identity management and occultation, uh, uh, transnational, transjurisdictional uh, transactions, uh, lower barriers, uh, low friction, and the whole complex of memory and forgetting. Uh, 
And what I feel coming to artificial intelligence now is that there must be a similar map possible to see what is it that you consider an inappropriate conduct, you know, uh, 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 impolite, uh, felony, crime, uh, massive crime, genocide, uh, offline, and how it's modified by the introduction now of artificial intelligence. So election interference, for example, it's not new. It's absolutely not new. As long as there have been elections and opposed states or tribes, there's been someone trying to get the other guys to have a friendlier leader. Uh, by lies, by gossip, by killing someone. Uh, we've had that forever. How, at what moment does it become scary because artificial intelligence is being used for deep fakes? And I'm not saying it's not scary. I'm not saying it's okay. I'm not saying, I'm not brushing it off. I'm just trying to say, how do we assemble the intention, the effect, and the means in a way that we can practically approach that's where I come from. I'm really struck by your idea about map making. And um, we've launched the Imagining the Digital Future Center here at Elon University, essentially to be map makers of, of this new terrain. There are lots of things to explore. You're totally right that these are not new human behaviors, but the, these new technologies enable some very old standing human behaviors to scale at unprecedented levels and even to um, exert themselves in new ways through artificial intelligence. I may, so I'm kind I, of interested I, in your sense I'm of what a center I, like I would ours. Like to, I'd like to add one more thing. And of course, they can become much more harmful. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm not dismissing either the benefit or the harmful side. I mean, uh, Bullying in a school could lead to really nasty behavior and uh, sadness, depression, and so forth. Uh, rarely would it lead to suicide. Now you can have this massive bullying, which eventually ends up in, I won't don't say mass suicides, but you can actually, uh, you know, become criminal by words. Uh, I'm mean, not dismissing any of that. So sorry for that. That actually anticipates sort of the line of, of questioning I, I wanted to pursue with you. So given this new environment and the, and the new ways that it can intensify the human experience as well as sort of remove humans from the experience, you know, you do a lot of work in this area. And I wonder what kind of research would be useful to people like you, to the policymaking community and to interested citizens about how we should approach these new technologies and how we can turn them to our benefit. Um there's lots to be done. There's lots already being done in, you know, fragmented and sometimes more coherent ways. I think uh, what would be very productive is to have a very, very strongly multidisciplinary approach where you always have a technologist on board for the project. That's that's one of the key things. Algorithms, uh, artificial intelligence, the internet, all these, these things. Algorithms are the plate tectonics of the digital world. And you can't do good engineering if you don't understand the soil. You can't do good social internet artificial intelligence policy if you don't understand the way things work. Many of these things are hidden uh, for commercial uh, gain, for or also for good reasons. I mean, companies hide their algorithms in order, you know, decent companies hide their algorithms for a decent purpose, which is making it more difficult for uh, criminals or malfeasance to manipulate and game and weaponize the algorithms. So there's a good reason for that. And this is a, a, a very hard thing to do for research because black box uh, research on algorithms is very tough and it may bump against walls. So you need to have the technologies there. Uh, we, I think there are open questions like, can you actually change an election result uh, through interventions in social media? Um, yes, no, or more appropriately, probably, when, how, and how much? This is not a purely yes or no question, I think. It's very complex. It's going to be to need very good sociological and political science criteria, very smart uh, experiment design. And you can't actually design the experiment, so you have to be more observational and choose what are the things that you're going to be observing and have one of the things that you people can can, can contribute very much is uh, 
background lines. You know, what's the background behavior before you have these interventions? Uh, you need to put together, I think, uh, psychologists, as I said, political scientists and sociologists. You need uh, very good people with data, but you need a lot of mind before the data. And I think that's a combination you are uniquely post uh, to post to 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 be able to do the the, the precedence of yourself, Jana, and your research groups. Really tell us that you know asking the right questions before putting in a lot of technology or data uh, processing is 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 key. Uh, I would also think it's productive for your center to look at what's happening, for example, with artificial intelligence uh, beyond or before the flashy stuff. We've been doing, not myself, but you know, the scientific community together has been doing amazing things with artificial intelligence, even with generative artificial intelligence that are not large language models. They are predicting material structure, chemicals for pharmaceutics, uh, treatments, uh, epidemiology, every field already has a strong application of AI. Many people were reluctant to announce their research as AI because they st we still have live memories of the AI winters, of the artificial intelligence winters. So people were careful of calling what they were doing, you know, deep learning, uh, uh, feedback learning, you know, very specific names to avoid being on the spot, put on the spot for artificial intelligence. I said, you know, this is reinforcement learning and everybody knows how it works, what its limitations are and so forth. So we have to look back at that and see what are the longer trends. I think these are very important things. And the other thing I think, again, you're, you're already on the way for that, is to bring in some very solid philosophers, uh, logicians, uh, ethicists, uh, the trend now is, you know, everybody has, uh, everybody and their uh, extended family to four degrees has an uh, AI ethics code. Get down to some that are actually actionable, that the engineer or the developer programming something, in, a, in coding something in a small outfit, not a large outfit, but, you know, someone in a garage this coding, uh, you know, I, I know the people, you know, these are young people out of high school or out of college or in college who are coding something that can read the labels on the food packaging and tell you whether you should eat it or not, or helping you assemble a diet in the supermarket through your cell phone. These guys are very small outfits. They are not surrounded by an AI ethics committee. They don't have, a, you know, make it reach this uh, this level. And you'll need more logicians than ethicists at this stage. Ethicists will, 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 will arrive like the rain, you know, what you need to search for are the, 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 the logicians, the ontologists and so forth. That's a big and ambitious uh, research agenda you've laid out for us. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe I'd invite you at the end here to put on your futurism hat. And, and and talk a little bit about the things that most ex excite you and think you'll be most beneficial from the rollout of AI and its involvement in the broader culture. And then in a similar vein, the things that are that most worry you that you think might be most harmful. Uh, so first, let me tell you, I have a little bit jaded view of some of these things. Uh, I like very much uh, a joke, which is around the cartoon, where on you know the left, you have uh, a team uh, in front of a computer, they are the advertising team, and they a guy is telling them, I have an artificial intelligence tool where I only put in two words, and it uh, develops a whole blurb, you know, two pages of blurb, which we can email to our clients. Uh, and on the other side, there's a client, uh, and there's a guy there sitting in front of the computer with the team and telling them, uh, you know, I have an artificial intelligence tool that gets all this blurb and distills it down to two words so we can know what they're actually trying to tell us. Uh, so I think the first thing I fear is overhyped, bubble, you know, uh, the, 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 there's a lot of that coming. What I believe is going to be a strong benefit is applications of artificial intelligence techniques for first for extracting information what ai is doing 
at present, this, besides the LLMs, which you, you will understand them in, in, in a small square of what I'm going to say, you use AI to extract regularities in information that doesn't seem to be very patterned. You find patterns in chaos, number one. Number two, you find exceptions in regularities. You have information which seems very regular, and then you find a small exception. That's, you know, credit card fraud. Uh, you see AI for that. You know, you, you see something very patterned, and then you suddenly realize a small exception. Uh, money laundering uh, is, is fought by this kind of thing, you know. Uh, and then the third one is extrapolating from, from, from data that are very complex. Uh, LLMs are an extreme case of extrapolating from huge data. Uh, what I fear, people don't understand. Uh, this is very basic geometry. Sorry to use a very geometric. If you have two points on a plane, you can draw a line, a straight line. And if you assume the world is more or less soft uh, in its behaviors, you can assume at least that points in the middle are well described by the straight line. You have three points. You have the choice of statistically adjusting, uh, you know, a mean square regression, what have you, and believe that you know everything will be more or less close to that, or you may adjust a cubic line, and then you may have weird results in the in in you know away from your from from your interval, and you may actually have weird results within the inside the interval. If we don't understand this very basic thing, people are going to be using AI for crazy stuff. The other thing I think that we need to get these good applications of AI is to understand that, you know, there's, we're very scared, rightly scared, about discrimination and bias coming from AI systems. But here I encourage everybody to look at Ricardo Baeza Yates' research where he peels off the origins of bias. And it always starts in the data. We always have data that already reflect human biases. This is, again, my, 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 my thing of, you know, peel off the internet of your problem and find if there's a core human or social problem in the middle there. And then, of course, don't dismiss the internet effect because they may be, you know, crazy. Uh, same thing here. Where's your bias coming from? I think very solid research should be made on how you mitigate this. Uh, and that, that's where I see, see all the positives coming. The negatives I see, you know, AI being used out of control uh, by evil parties, call them mischief, call them uh, misdemeanors, mis malfeasance, whatever name you have, uh, for things that are already, you know, done for evil. You know, you have deep fakes uh, seeming to have an interview of a politician, or words from a politician, words of command from a military that call everybody to stop the economy and go into the refugees, uh, into the shelters. We have precedent for that. We have to work on the human mind. We have to do a lot of work on the human mind and of social institutions to dampen these oscillations, to dampen these extreme effects. And uh, and there I'm scared. I'm, I'm, I'm really very worried that in the last few years, the trend has been more away from moderation, from, from damping uh, oscillations than in the direction of, you know, damping oscillations. Uh, it's, we'll ne we are never going to stop having statistical flukes or freaks or whatever you call them, but, you know, to dampen their effects. And we seem to be on a roll to the contrary. I always enjoy talking to you. I'm always inspired talking to you. And I'm always grateful to you for your big heart and the way that you always sort of make sure that the people who are thinking about technology um, are remember that it's humans who are at the the users and the recipients and sometimes the victims of it. And I so I love your vision and I'm really grateful for this time with you. 